Everyone, I can see a lot of you logging in today for our weekly live with Dr. McDougall webinar and uh, many of you are regulars and uh, some of you are new. If you're new today here, maybe why don't you go ahead and type it in the chat that you, you're a, a, um, a new webinar attendee and uh, we want to give you a, a special welcome. Dr. McDougall is uh, always uh, just a pleasure to have here and we all are very thankful that he makes this time every week or almost every week unless there's a, a special guest he makes time to be with us and present us with some interesting topics and answer questions like today so uh, i want to welcome you dr mcdougall how are you today how is your summer going well summer's going great uh, uh the thing is and i really do mean this you say that i it's a hardship uh, for me to, uh, or some type of, of effort for me to do these webinars. I really miss doing them when Dr. Lyle and Dr. Lim take over, but uh, we kind of kind of mix it up. And uh, there are some times that I have to be away. Like last week, I was in Michigan visiting my 92 year old, 93 year old mother on her birthday. And so, uh, you know, <clears throat> I know you appreciate all our staff. And after seeing Dr. Lim, I'm sure you understand why the McDougall program. Uh, in particular, a 10-day program has improved in its delivery of uh, solid medical care. Uh, Dr. Lim is an amazing physician, and I'm so happy to have him help me. I'm always there, though. I'm, I'm there for your visits. Uh, I'm there for advice. There are a few things that Dr. Lim has to still learn from the old man. So, uh, you know, uh, our 10-day programs, like the one we're having coming up here in August, uh, I will be in full attendance, but the addition of Dr. Lim will be much appreciated by all of you. The staff just gets better and better all the time. Uh, and, and beginning this, before I get to the questions, I wanted to make sure that you all saw last month's newsletter. I put a you know a good solid week into that newsletter. <clears throat> and and what I, what's what it's about is uh, how to protect yourself from colon cancer. Uh, what you hear from your doctors is the way to save yourself from colon cancer is to have a colonoscopy, and that is just a bold faced lie. Uh, and I can't say it any other way uh, because the scientific literature is absolutely clear. The profits, the money are the absolute determination of the advice that you're given. And uh, if uh, you haven't read this July uh, 2016 newsletter, I encourage you to do it because I relied upon, first of all, a couple of my mentors. Uh, and uh, you'll see a picture of Dr. Ernst Winder uh, he was the head of the American Health Foundation. He worked for Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, he's the man who discovered, proved the connection of, uh, of uh, smoking cigarettes to lung cancer. And Ernst Winder and I had breakfast together in Seattle, Washington in um, 1978. Uh, and we had breakfast together. I kind of sought him out. We, I was an attendee. He was a speaker at the first diet and cancer conference, 1978 in Seattle, Washington. I had breakfast with him. And uh, that was our first interaction. I had breakfast with him. And one of the side notes that I make is that uh, when the waitress came around, she asked, what did you want to order of Dr. Winder? He said, I'll, I'll have whatever, whatever that guy over there is having. And he pointed to me. And of course, I had oatmeal and fruit. And uh, we're talking about uh, his career, and he said to me, you know, I went to the uh, experts back in the 1950s, early 1950s, and late 40s, and I said cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. And he particularly said Sloan Kettering Institute, the specialist there, uh, he was talking to, and they said, nah, how could it be? How could smoking cigarettes cause lung, uh, lung cancer? He says, well, you know, you take this tube of tobacco, you burn it, you inhale it, and it damages the lung cells, and you get lung cancer. And of course, it's been proved by observational studies that uh, tobacco use causes uh, lung cancer. And so as we're finishing our breakfast, he says to me, I went to the same experts. And I said, uh, what you eat causes uh, colon cancer. And they said, nah, how could it be? What you eat causes colon cancer. He says, yeah, you know, you eat this stuff and particularly meat, animal foods, and uh, the remnants of these foods, they go to your colon and uh, they damage the colon cells and they turn into colon cancer and they spread the rest through the rest of the body and they kill you and his american health foundation which was in existence for more than 20 years 
employed uh, more than 100 scientists, published 800 scientific papers. The American Health Foundation did, and these were papers on uh, how we eat and how we live, and uh, particularly cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Uh, it's absolutely obvious, isn't it, folks, that what you put in your colon causes health or disease? But to still today, your doctors don't talk to you about that. Instead, they tell you to get a colonoscopy. And uh, <clears throat> there are two, two events that happened in the last six months. One is the Canadian Preventative Task Force. Uh, they came out with a statement for Canadian citizens that they are not to get a colonoscopy for screening. They advised it uh, to be uh, unwise to do because of the costs, the preparation time, the dangers, and so on of a colonoscopy. Well, a couple of weeks ago, the US, US Preventative Services Task Force came out with their recommendations for colon cancer prevention. They listed seven techniques. Those techniques included uh, checking your stool for blood uh, by various various ways, uh, checking DNA in your stool by a new method called Cologuard. Uh, they recommended uh, colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy and also a uh, x-ray technique uh, that is done with a CT scanner. It's called a virtual colonoscopy. And uh, they mentioned clearly that these are not rated in any particular order of uh, benefit. And uh, that uh, any of them will give you the same outcome in terms of saving your life, which isn't much. I mean, you get a reduction in risk of uh, dying of colon cancer that's uh, quite small. It's, I think it's one in 300. Uh, people uh, screen benefits and uh, colonoscopy, it's about one in 800. You can read it, uh, the actual numbers there. Uh, that's in dying of colon cancer, but it's not overall mortality. There's no change in your day of death on average if you get these screening tests, any of them, the blood, the sigmoid, the colonoscopy. It's just to reduce your risk of dying of colon cancer, but you increase your risk of dying of other things. And it so shows because all cause, cause mortality has not changed. Like, for example, if you have a colonoscopy, you're risking your life today, today, uh, to the possibility of perforation of your colon, bleeding, anesthetic death. You're risking your life today with the theoretical possibility that you'll reduce your risk of dying of colon cancer in one, two, or three decades. That's what you're trading. So you, one life saved, maybe by discovering and removing a precancerous polyp is one life lost by going through this uh, uh, brutal procedure. You know, uh, brutal may not be the best word I should have chosen, but certainly aggressive procedure. And the reason you go through these aggressive procedures is that they cost on average uh, $3,100. Whereas the sigmoid exam is less than 200. That's a two foot scope. Uh, the sigmoid being a six to eight foot scope or you can do stool for blood, which can be somewhere between three and $40. Uh, so that's the reason that they're popular is because of the business, the gastroenterologists, the uh, hospitals, the surgical centers, the people who manufacture these tubes uh, to look into your colon. Uh, it's just plain and simple. So here, I just wanna summarize uh, that all of this is known by the US Preventative Services Task Force. Uh, colonoscopies are not recommended for screening in Europe. And the Canadians just came out and said to their citizens, don't get colonoscopies. Yet that's all you're told. And in opposition, as I started, Ernst Winder told us that colon cancer was caused by diet. And another one of my mentors, Dennis Burkett, told me in 1971 when he was head of ministries of health of Uganda, observing 10 million people, 1,000 hospitals for 17 years. He never saw a single case of colon cancer among the citizens of Uganda. And it was because of their diet, which was a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables and very little meat and no dairy products. So here on the one hand, we have the truth, which is free and 100% effective. And on the other hand, we have these expensive, dangerous techniques, which, um, which are highly profitable and that's all you hear about. So let me just add a final note. My recommendation is, uh, of course, to change your diet to eat well. But many of my patients have been eating poorly up until the time they've met me and they've already started to have polyps. 
on average between 30 and 60% of Americans have polyps. So, um, and you're healthy and you don't even know it. So you come to me, what I say is it's reasonable to have your colon exam examined by a sigmoidoscope, which by the way is a test that's almost impossible to get in the United States because of the dominance of the colonoscopy business. So a safe two foot insertion of a tube with no sedation, no risk, it gives uh, actually the, uh, proven benefits for reducing colon rectal cancer death, whereas colonoscopy has not, based on randomized trials, shown to improve the quantity of your life. That's the truth. Uh, another uh, opportunity you might want to take is you, after, again, around 60 years of age, you might want to check your stool every other year. That's what I recommend. You know, diet first, but if you want to catch those few cases of uh, colon cancer that bother a few people, save a few lives, you check your stool for blood. There's some cheap techniques your doctor should be recommending that maybe every couple of years until you're 75 and no, then no screening should be done. But you can read all of that in my July 2016 newsletter. The other thing I want to note is I heard that the United Nations recommended that worldwide we put a tax on eating meat because it's so destructive to the environment. Now, of course, there's a lot of political issues involved here. You know, a whole bunch of uh, people don't want to be regulated by the government. Well, excuse me, there's a role for the government. There's a world role for the United Nations. There's a, there are a lot of reasons to save planet Earth. And if it takes a tax on the cattle industry or the dairy industry or maybe on outright law of labeling that says, if you eat this beef, it'll get you, could give you colon cancer. Or if you eat this dairy, you'll get rheumatoid arthritis. If you eat these pork chops, you'll pollute the streams and the oceans and the rivers and destroy our planet. Just like on the warnings on cigarette packages, the Surgeon General says that smoking cigarettes will give you lung cancer. Well, the United Nations and all sane, well-educated uh, people involved in this business tell you if you put the wrong foods in your intestinal tract, particularly your colon, you're going to get colon cancer. All right. So yeah, anyway, that's what I had to say. What, one other thing I should mention as we go on, we're having an advanced study weekend coming up here, 16th through 18th of September. We have a lot of great guests on it. I don't know that I, no, I didn't. Yes. But you can find that on the website. Well, we have more guests than we've ever had in the past. Yeah. We have uh, five young doctors. Dr. Lynn being one of them, my son, Craig McDougall, another one, uh, Matthew Letterman, another one, um, <clears throat> Alona Pauldy, another one, and Tom Campbell will be there. Colin Campbell will be there also, T. Colin Campbell, uh, on a board, you know, discussing, questioning these uh, young doctors and, you know, making sure they're in line. And so will uh, the fathers of Matthew Letterman and uh, and Dr. Lim's dad, who's an OBGYN doctor, he'll be there. And uh, us four old guys are going to really put the uh, the hot iron to the young guys after they give their speech. And we have Dean Arnish and Susan Roberts and uh, Dr. Mandrola, who is a specialist in atrial fib. And uh, Brenda Davis will be there. I mean, really top talent. It will be the best advanced study weekend we've ever had. So it does it's signed like up. It, yes. you're, you're going to be there too. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And and uh, let's remind people that they can go to drmcdougall.com and sign up from right there, correct? That's the easy way to do it. It's uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's a deal. It, it's the most fun. Those of you who've been to it know. Oh, yes. And we're also going to video broadcast it. <clears throat> uh, we'll send announcements on, on that. But being live, there's nothing like being live. Oh, no. Watching the other people who are on the same message and eating the food and getting a chance to meet uh, all these really, really, really knowledgeable speakers that will change your life and tell you the truth. Right. But if they right. don't tell you the truth or I don't think that they emphasize the right points, I'm going to be there. <laughs> and I always have the last word. As any of you who've been to the conference, you know. I, you get a few questions first, but at the end, I get the last word. You, you get questions. the last word. Well, the interaction that goes on is something that, of course, um, watching it from a broadcast, you, you can't, like you say, you can't meet the doctors and or the, the speakers. And, of course, you cannot broadcast the food, which is amazing. No, 
I suppose you can make make it ahead of time. Right, right. Well, thank you, Dr. McDougall, and and um, everybody, you can get the newsletter for free on drmcdougall.com website. Thank you for um, you 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 have done a, a, a webinar on this topic as well, but it's always. Okay. Just uh, you can't remind people enough. I don't think about this because we are bombarded by doctors uh, about you know get a colonoscopy, get a colonoscopy, oh, yeah. constantly. Well, the, the truth is there, and I, I add links to the actual articles. You can just go read the articles. You can print out the articles. You can sit down with your recommending doctor. You can say, "Is this the truth?" And they'll say, "Yeah, it's the truth." Well, why you recommended it? Well, it's the gold standard. Why is it the gold standard? Well, because on average we make three thousand one hundred dollars. Why would it not gold, That's the gold, gold, standard. gold standard? You get it? Exactly. <laughs> You're being harmed. And the, and the other thing is uh, relying on this technology of quote early detection uh, diverts you from what is really true to save your life, which is the food, a starch based diet with fruits and vegetables. You can read all about that on the on the website. Right, and let's just say that here we have pretty much your. Uh, this is I have this handy all the time, and you know uh, your new book is coming out soon. Yeah, the new book, I think September twenty eighth. You can pre order it on Amazon. It's the healthiest diet on the planet. But another notice on the Starch Solution is it comes out in audio. Uh, oh, we just, we just yeah, we just signed a contract to have uh, it put on audio. I won't be doing the. Narration. Right. We uh, <laughs> have another narrator, but it's a nice way you uh, you can listen to it in the car uh, when you're driving along. Uh, those of you who are who are visually impaired, uh, this gives you an opportunity to have somebody read the book to you. Right. So right. Uh, uh, the Starch Solution will be out on audio. The uh, healthiest diet on the planet has uh, uh, has made the best selling list uh, of, of of the top 500 books, and it's not even out. So, uh, yeah, it's not even out, and it's already in the top 500 list. That's it, great. It's a great book. You'll enjoy it. Very but you good. Had some, you had some questions that have been good. I do, yes. And actually, uh, just by looking at the chat here, there are a couple of, um, a few comments, uh, and I, if, I don't know if you could uh, clarify on this. Uh, some people saying that, uh, or wondering if, if it is fat or if it, it is glucose that is cancer-promoting. I don't know exactly okay. what they mean by this, but yeah. you brought you do. Well, that that that's uh, an interesting question that uh, can't be answered uh, specifically. <laughs> uh, you can you can go to the uh, well, uh, Dr. Snow, who's the head of epidemiology. Uh, he discovered, and I may be giving you the wrong dates, but I believe it was in the 1700s. Uh, he discovered. Uh, the uh, field of epidemiology in London, when he looked at people getting sick with the disease we now know as cholera. And he uh, plotted out throughout London, he plotted out uh, where the cases of cholera were occurring. And what he found was they occurred around this pump called the Broad Street Pump. And it's still in London. In fact, people have sent me pictures of this pump. And uh, the cases were distributed just around, uh, you know, within the area where people got uh, their water from the pump. And he noticed also that there was a segment of the population within that area that did not get cholera, and they worked at a beer factory and they got their water from the beer factory. So he put this all together and he figured out there's something in that well that's giving people cholera and killing them. It was another hundred years before the bacteria of Vibrio cholera was discovered. But it didn't matter whether they discovered the bacteria or not. He just knew there was something in the in the in the well. So what he did is he took the pump handle off the well and a cholera disappeared. So it's the same thing with the food. Uh, you don't have to know whether it's the benzopyrenes in the meat or the lack of fiber or the changes in bacteria that occur because of the animal uh, material that's in the colon. Uh, actually, these bacteria, they convert uh, various components of the meat into cancer-causing chemicals like nitrosamines. And, uh, you don't have to know what are the individual components. And by the way, if you study uh, Ernst Winder's work from the American Health Foundation and lots of other work, I mean, thousands of studies have looked into this and identified different ingredients that uh, that initiate and promote colon cancer. So you know where the well is. 
you know how to take the pump handle off the well. That's all you really need to know. If you would like to be, <clears throat> you know, you'd like to be uh, more informed, there again are thousands of papers that uh, implicate many chemicals that are in the animal foods uh, and uh, many chemicals that are produced in the bowel by bacteria that grow when you feed animal foods to the bowel. And you can become an expert there, but you don't need that. You just need to know where the problem comes from. Just like cigarette smoking, you don't need to know whether it's which of the tars or the benzopyrene or what factor in the cigarette smoking is causing you to have uh, lung cancer. You just need to know where the well is. You just stop smoking the cigarettes. And I, I think that's the best general answer for you. And uh, no one will counter the facts that I just told you, no one that colon cancer is caused by what you put in your colon, nor will anybody counter the fact that screening is highly ineffective and that at most you should have stool for blood and or a sigmoid beginning around age 60. That'll give you the most benefit with the least, least convenience and least risk. I've been recommending that for two or three decades. If you look at my August 2010 newsletter, called uh, colonoscopy, a gold standard to avoid. You'll find I told you all this six years ago, almost seven years ago uh, in that newsletter, it's still the same, cash is king. So, okay. <laughs> That's true. Dr. McDougall, um, what about, there's a couple of questions here about um, hormonal contraceptives since estrogen has now been categorized as a carcinogen, someone says. What are your thoughts about well, I, I, I assume they're talking about uh, two areas. One is uh, birth control. Right. And the other is uh, uh, HRT replacement. With birth control, uh, I think, and, and I'm telling you this as a father, uh, as uh, a grandfather to soon have children in, that, in those years where birth control is important, uh, I've uh, always recommended uh, birth control in healthy people, even the birth control pill because I think the, the advantages outweigh the benefits, particularly in young people who are just kind of figuring out their way around and accidents are easy. Uh, IUDs is another way to go, uh, but birth controls do cause uh, problems like blood clotting, increase your risk of breast cancer. Uh, there, are, there are definite hazards, but there are definite hazards to people's uh, uh, social life, uh, education, uh, their family life, their health, and so on to getting pregnant in an un untimely manner. So uh, again, it's a risk versus benefit. I think as you get older in terms of birth control, you ought to figure out by then where babies come from. And you ought to be able to figure some ways uh, to control your impulses uh, or your, uh, can I say ejaculations on this show? <laughs> come on, look, guys. If you don't, if you don't know how this works, there, there's. there's <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so I think uh, with, as you get to be, say, in a stable relationship, you get to be of a certain age. I think birth control uh, probably risks out uh, pills, out risks the advantages, but maybe not. Uh, you've got to determine. It's a personal decision. Right. The risk and, and the, uh, disadvantage. As far as hormone replacement therapy. I wrote an extensive chapter on that in my women's book, which you can get on my website, or you can probably get it for 50 cents on Amazon. It's called the McDougal Program for Women. Nothing that I've written has changed. Uh, <clears throat> I recommend HRT as a cream uh, that's made in a compounding pharmacy to women who feel that they need it. And the reason they would need it is that they have uh, uh, debilitating menopausal symptoms such as hot flashes, uh, or they think mood changes that are related to lack of hormones, then I prescribe a cream of estradiol, 0 0.05 milligrams with 20 milligrams of progesterone, applied to the skin daily, and you can up or down the dose. And your doctor can order this. I rarely add testosterone. Uh, men and women think uh, if you give your, your woman testosterone, you're going to turn her into this uh, uh, whatever you get the rest of the picture. <laughs> yes. I, just, I just haven't found it working. I, I just so testosterone. I rarely add to the creams. I will on occasion, but it's uh, testosterone for men and testosterone for women in terms of libido is well, well overrated. Uh, 
So I give it as creams because it's much more effective. It's 30 times more potent than taking it as pills, and it's much safer. Estrogen increases the risk of endometrial cancer, gallbladder disease, uh, blood clotting, uh, breast cancer. When you add progesterone, it decreases, not eliminates, but decreases the risk of breast and uterine cancer. So I give it always in combination. And uh, the pills, as I say, are just not very effective or dependable. They have to go through the gut, through the liver. It's called first pass kinetics. And what happens is when these drugs go through the liver, they're rearranged and you don't know the quantity or quality of the drug that comes out of the liver to affect the tissues. So skin creams, I think, are best. And again, it's a risk versus benefit ratio that you have to think about. You might want to give them a try. Uh, easy for doctors to prescribe them. And it's all written up in my women's book if you want to have uh, you want to have the science and, and the, uh, the clear prescriptions that I've been using for oh, probably 25 years with women. And I, I think some of you should seriously consider using these uh, HRT creams. Uh, you use the least amount required to make you feel the way you want to feel. Also, you might want to use vaginal estrogen creams because as women become older, God says, she says, <laughs> that there's no reason to have sex as you say become 50 because you won't live long enough to raise your children. So since there's no reason to be reproductive, there's no reason to have the vagina work as it should easily, but it does often. I'm not saying that uh, women have to take these hormones to make uh, for good sexual relationships, but you may decide that things aren't working well. The vagina becomes too dry or thin. Uh, painful intercourse, and uh, at that time, I'll often prescribe estrace vaginal cream, which is estradiol, which can be bought in any pharmacy. Again, it's prescription, and you use just enough to make things the way you want. Uh, generally, that's uh, one or two applications a week, but it can be once every two weeks, or uh, some people, you know, they have uh, sexual relationships on a time schedule. Uh, you know, maybe they have sexual relationships once or twice a month. And you can use this uh, S-Trace vaginal cream three or four days before your planned date. And uh, it will improve the vaginal, uh, vaginal tissues in that shorter period of time. You want to use as little as possible to get the effects you're looking for. Right, right. Okay, thank you. That, I think you answered all the questions that were related to that topic. Dr. McDougall, um, talking about a little bit about congestive heart disease. I think I've heard you talk about uh, the starch-based diet that you recommend as something that, that you also recommend your patients. Can you talk about that, uh, about congestive sure. heart disease? Well, congestive heart disease occurs when the heart muscle gets damaged. And then it just becomes weak and its ability to eject blood out decreases from 65% of the volume. Each heartbeat ejects 65% of the volume to say less than 50% or sometimes 30% or sometimes 10% because of damage to the heart muscle. Now that can be damaged by closure of big blood vessels. In other words, typical coronary artery disease, heart attacks, which is common to lead to a heart failure. Uh, but also it can be caused by small vessel disease. And that's where the tiny vessels, the ones you don't see on a mangiogram, the ones that lie distal to the big vessels, they get diseased. And as a result, you develop uh, cardiomyopathy and congestive heart failure. Uh, so if you go to the doctor with congestive heart failure and they do an angiogram, which is the gold standard, whoop, uh, they do an angiogram and they find that your big blood vessels are clear. Well, that, that's not unusual uh, because the problem is likely the small vessels and they can't see those on angiograms and small vessel diseases likewise do the same thing as large vessel disease. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not you should eat a low, a low salt diet if you have congestive heart failure. In fact, mortality has been shown to be increased on very low, on low salt diets. But again, this is an individual situation and judgment has to be used. You know, I've talked to you about the Kempner diet, which is less than 500 milligrams of sodium, which has been very, very effective in treating people who've lost, you know, 70, 80, 90% of their heart function. 
by eating a diet of rice and fruit and fruit juice and sugar. But there is a general uh, epidemiologic uh, observational data that says that these low salt diets, and they're talking about low salt in the range of say a thousand milligrams, not 500 like temperature or less, that they actually might increase mortality from uh, people with congestive heart failure. Uh, yes, you should go on uh, what I uh, call the McDougall diet for any better term, uh, a simple diet of based on rice and or potatoes and or sweet potatoes and or uh, non-starchy vegetables like kale and just a little bit, lettuce, broccoli, and some fruits. And uh, I think in general, probably if you could tolerate the sodium, probably a 1,000, 1,500 milligrams of sodium, which is about a half a teaspoon on the surface of the food today will make it palatable and doesn't work out if it makes your heart failure worse, then you have to go on something like the Kempter diet, which is about 500 milligrams of sodium. But you can get great improvement, uh, even though you've lost that much of your heart, but you've got to stop, you got to stop a real high salt intake, like 5,000, 15,000 milligrams that typically Americans will eat, not typically, either but often Americans will eat it. And you gotta stop the fat. Uh, some of you have seen my video done by Dr. Swank of the sludging of the blood. Well, when you sludge the blood, uh, that creates great peripheral resistance and very hard work on the, on the heart. <coughs> so as a result, you want to uh, eat uh, a diet that's clean so your blood flow is really, really effective. Right. right. And. Uh, Dr. McDougall, um, what about, uh, of course, some people don't like to give up their uh, certain habits. And so um, there are comments about these uh, studies that are done about uh, having two glasses of wine to improve oh, yeah. heart, heart function. And uh, what, what about that for someone who has congestive heart disease? What about two glasses of wine a day? <laughs> it's probably okay. It's, uh, I don't think, I remember wine or alcohol is the ultimate in no cholesterol, low fat food. In fact, uh, when I was a training doctor, uh, the patients I saw with the cleanest arteries were my skid row alcoholics. <laughs> when we autopsied them, the arteries were as crystal clear as possible because they basically lived on a no cholesterol, right. low fat diet. The problem with recommending alcohol for me to people, and I don't, is that nine out of 10 of you will understand a glass or two a week. But one out of 10 of you, you can't. You're alcoholics. And what you'll say is Dr. McDougall said drinking alcohol is good for your heart or good for this or good for that. And then uh, it'll give you an excuse to get back into your alcoholism and you'll beat up the, beat up the spouse and the kids and get in a car and kill people. And uh, that's it's totally unacceptable. So my recommendation is to not drink alcohol, even if it has some perceived health benefits, which are minimal. It has uh, so many more harms. As a general recommendation, no doctor should recommend that you drink alcohol for your health. Now, if you want to drink it because it's pleasurable, which it is, that's why people drink it. You want to drink it because it's sociable, which it can be. I mean, fine. If you're over 21, you can make this kind of a decision. But don't don't say, well, Dr. McDougall and any other doctor said it will overall improve the quality and quantity of your life. One out of 10 of you, it's going to destroy your life. Right. And that's, uh, well, that's enough to, to say no. Uh, thank you, yeah, Dr. McDougall. <laughs> by the way, those of you who have an alcohol problem, you know it. Right. You, you, may, you may not have uh, come to full admission, but you know you have a problem. And so, you know. Right, right. Very good. How about, would you comment on um, fatty liver and how to reverse it, or if it is even reversible? It's 100% reversible. And uh, it occurs fatty liver infiltration, which has another name that I can't remember right now, but uh, anyway, so what happens is uh, as you eat the fatty American diet, uh, fat deposits under your skin and makes you fat. It also deposits in the liver. Uh, 
what was it Fort Wall? What do they call the duck that they fed? <laughs> anyway, the duck delivers the Fort Wall. Anyway, the same thing happens to people. You get fat stuffed in your liver, and uh, that fat in your liver causes inflammation, and they say it can lead to cirrhosis and death from the uh, uh, from the inflammation caused by the fat in the liver. And the way you pick it up is uh, generally when we do blood tests, there are a couple of blood tests that indicate liver inflammation, ALT and AST, or SGPT and SGOT are the names of the tests. Uh, there are only two tests, but there are two different names for each of them. And you see that inflammation, and then you can take and you can do uh, uh, various ultrasounds, and you can see that the liver is uh, enlarged with fat. You can do liver biopsies, which I you know wouldn't re recommend. But if you lose weight by any means, you have your teeth wired together, you have bariatric surgery, <laughs> you, have, you have your lower extremities cut off so you can't get to the refrigerator, you know, uh, take cancer chemotherapy. You know, <laughs> right. Any way but anyway, that you lose weight, that fatty infiltration of the liver will go away. But this only sensible way to do it is to eat a starch-based diet that's low in fat because then you get good health, you lose the weight, prevent colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, type 2 diabetes, etc. So, yeah, there are lots of ways to lose weight, but there's only one right way, and that's to get on the human diet, which is a traditional starch-based diet. Yeah, it's reversible. It's always reversible. But you right. may be left with some damage. You may be left with some scar tissue, which is called cirrhosis. So uh, now's the time to act. Right, right, before it gets uh, any worse. Right before uh, you get permanent liver damage. Right. Um, but you were talking about losing weight, Dr. McDougall, and so uh, someone had asked about uh, if there is any science behind behind what fast what what fat is lost first. Like this person says, well, it seems that the face of a person it seems to be the part that shows that you're losing weight uh, first, uh, while okay. abdominal uh, abdominal fat looks seems to be <laughs> hard. What what do you think about it? <laughs> I know it's generally it's lost generally all over the body at a similar rate, inside and out. It's just that you uh, wear clothes that uh, cover up the obvious, whereas people can easily see it in your fate, face. Uh, you may be left with some skin left over. People ask about that on my website under my star McDougal. There's a fellow by the name of Frank. Uh, I can't recall his last name, but I just got an email from him. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, and he came to one of our uh, programs that are put on by Whole Foods. He, he, was, he is a Whole Foods employee. And uh, he lost, uh, I think, 150 pounds. Mm. And you can imagine that there was a lot of stretched skin involved. Well, I did a video with Frank, and you can hear him tell about how, yes, he has a little tiny bit of loose skin, but nothing he'd ever want to go to surgery for. And that video I recorded, I bet, four years ago. And I heard from Frank two weeks ago, and he sent me pictures of himself. He looks exactly the same as he did after he lost 150 pounds. And he just wrote me to thank me. And he also wrote John Mackey, the co-founder of Whole Foods, who sent him and sends other employees to our programs. And he wrote uh, John to tell him, you know, he changed his life. Thank you very much. And for four years, He's had a brand new life, as many people are. I mean, you can see uh, many of our star McDougalers. Once people get this, once they understand this is food poisoning and the food we eat tastes better than the food they eat, with all the uh, with all the sickness and the environmental issues and all the animal cruelty issues, people look around and go, why doesn't everybody get this? But it seems like everybody is starting to get this. Uh, the paleo... paleo People are wise, are getting wiser. The low carbers are in more disfavor. So I, I'm optimistic. The question is, will it happen soon enough? It's happening. Right, right. It's how how soon. Very good. Dr. Mike, can you <laughs> okay, just this is a a side a parenthesis. I think this is a very uh, easy question to answer for you. Um, what about using, I know you use, you allow people to use sugar, a little bit of sugar for, like you said, to make food uh, taste better, but what about using honey? People are asking about that since it is not really vegan. Well, you know, I'm not a moral vegan. <laughs> in fact, 
In fact, I, I, I'm not going to mention the conference, but uh, I was invited to speak at a vegan conference recently. And when they found out that I say I eat turkey every other Thanksgiving, I was fired. Right. <laughs> now, now, the reason I take that stand is because uh, vegan is not the issue. I mean, it is, it's, it's a point of view. I am vegan. I, I am personally vegan. Uh, I, eat, uh, I eat no more animal food than you can put in your hand every other year, okay? Uh, but so many vegans uh, are sick and fat because they don't really get the health part of the message. They wanna save the environment and the animals, which is good, but then they don't save themselves. And by not saving themselves, they present themselves as uh, fat, acne-ridden, greasy people to folks are trying to convince. And you talk to someone, you say to somebody, you know, you need to be a vegan because uh, of all the cruelty to animals and because of the environmental issues. And they look at you and they go, if I have to look like you, I'm not gonna become a vegan. So I've taken the position that I don't want people to think of me as a vegan. A vegan could be Coca-Cola and potato chips. And when I get questioned, people get real brutal. They have to me for, I've been saying this for 35 years, they get very, very brutal. Uh, they, uh, you know, say, well, you eat turkey every other Thanksgiving, a piece about this big. And we think you're just a terrible SOB for doing that. I say, I bet I've saved more turkeys than you have. <laughs> you know, I want you to focus on the fact that this is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. And I also tell those vegans, do you use no animal products at all? Do you fly on an airplane? Do you drive in a car? You know, these uh, so many things in our, that they contact every day have animal foods as part of their machinery. So don't give me this holier and lol garbage. Wasn't that the word we were saying now? Garbage. Don't give me this holier and lol garbage about uh, about veganism. It's a fine idea. I'm I'm proud to say that I'm a vegan, and I am. But my, but myself and that turkey suffer every other year just to get you focused on what's important, which is you eat a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. I hope that's clear enough, ladies and gentlemen. This is, is not a religion. I'm not a preacher. Oh, I'm a preacher. I'm not a, <laughs> it's not a, not a I just want you to get the message across. And, uh, you know, don't live like too many vegans do, which is on vegan cheesecake and, uh, right. um, you know, vegan cookies. I just can't give up my vegan peanut butter cookies. Right. Yeah, look at me, I'm 50 pounds overweight. I don't understand it. I'm vegan. <laughs> right. So, so that's my message to you. Like me or not, I don't care. I'm not going to change it. I haven't changed it 35 years, but I will say I never tell you which Thanksgiving I have that turkey on. And you, some of you may even wonder if I really do. And I might be lying on that point. But my official stand is I have a two by two inch piece of turkey every other Thanksgiving. We just don't know when, but that's okay. Just don't when if I'm, if I'm telling one big fat lie. So yeah, what yeah. about honey then? So basically, well, honey, well, honey, honey is is again, it's it's an animal product, but again, that seems that seems a little far fetched for my way of thinking. Uh, right. right. Uh, uh, is uh, I don't see the bees suffering that much. Exactly. And as far right. as health goes, it's the same health as maple syrup. White sugar, brown sugar, uh, molasses, uh, agave—they're all the same. Right. So pick one over the other. I don't care. Use, use, you know, if you want to. But you, you, you have to understand. I think, I think vegan uh, doesn't even fit to white sugar because they use a bone, cow bone, uh, to purify the sugar. But you could probably buy sugar that hasn't been manufactured by the use of cow bones to purify it. You know. Mm -hmm. Spend right. your time however you want. Exactly. Well, it's not the issue. The issue is to 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 cut the the main. You know the, what you were saying that all the animals. Well, the, re the reason again, and another point. This is probably monotonous for people hearing. Is the reason I teach it in terms of red and green, go or stop, mm -hmm. is because most people can't do moderation, it's just like alcoholics right. and people who use tobacco. So I have to teach as the starch solution does and as the new healthiest diet of the planet does or as my color picture book which is free in 24 languages and on my website it teaches uh, in terms of yes or no not maybe not caution it's because people can't change their behavior easily when it, there's uh 
some ambiguity. Yeah, I, yeah, sure. You could you could have a couple slices of pepperoni pizza every uh, month or week or two months or three months, and uh, you'd be in great shape. Uh, there was a time when my kids would bring in pepperoni pizza, you know, after they came home, and I'll tell you, Dad had a hard time. <laughs> And, and for me, when I ate pepperoni pizza, it wasn't a slice. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I have that kind of behavior, too. I either say yes or no. And uh, that's why I teach it that way. And it's a completely different message than why I have turkey every other Thanksgiving. Right. It's not because I miss it or enjoy it. It's to focus your attention on what is point. important, which right. is a start. Yeah, and moderation really doesn't. I mean, we can see it every day. If moderation worked, we wouldn't be seeing so many people overweight or yeah, overweight. moderation kills. I said that originally, and uh, Esselstyn uh, picked it up as a mantra. Moderation <laughs> kills. Right, right. Uh, Doctor McDougall, uh, I, mean, I, I didn't really, I didn't really say it originally. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm for, sure. For thousands of years, it has said moderation kills. Right. But uh, anyway. Um, okay, we have a few people really interested in your answer about uh, is PCOS curable on your diet? Yes, uh, on any weight loss program it's curable. Just like the fatty liver infiltration, and if you lose weight, PCOS will go away. Uh, that's polycystic ovary syndrome where you uh, get infertility and you get excess testosterone, you can grow facial hair. Facial hair won't go away. You know, once you start making facial hair as a woman, uh, you have to go and get a electrolysis or laser or whatever they do to remove the hair follicle. But the other symptoms and the infertility will go away and the cysts will also disappear. Uh, in the general Western population, about 40% of women, if you uh, do a sonogram of their ovaries, they have polycystic disease. They have multiple cysts in their ovaries because of the Western diet. But for some of them, it becomes such a, a dysfunctional problem because they grow so large and they uh, produce uh, so many testosterone and other hormones that it becomes of clinical significance. Uh, so 40% of the population has, female population on Western diet has those cysts. Uh, they are reversible. And uh, sometimes, sometimes they're so big, they've been there so long that they aren't reversible. And then you come to a situation where the doctor says you have to have that ovary taken out or that cyst taken out. Why? Because it could rupture and give you pain. Or why? Because it could uh, 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 twist and uh, strangulate your ovary. This is uh, the, the idea that you need to remove the ovary is unproven. Unless it's giving you trouble, you just leave it alone, even if it's a big cyst. Uh, because uh, having a, a preventative surgery like this does more harm than good. Risk of death from anesthesia, bleeding, complications, far outweighs uh, any benefit you're going to get from taking that cyst out. So you'll be told, however, by your OBGYN doctor mm -hmm. that this must be removed. Well, why wants to be removed, doctor? Well, because I just bought a new Tesla and my kids are going to private school. So that's right. why it must be removed. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, <laughs> we love your honesty. <laughs> that, that's, that's what's going on in the doctor's head. Exactly. But, uh, the patient is thinking that they're more good. But look it up. I mean, do the research on yeah, the internet. Yeah. Uh, we're going to fit in one more question, Dr. Martugal. And then I, I would like to talk, I would like for you to talk a little about your, your father in law and then oh, show a true. fun video that, we, that I found of you and him. Okay, good. Let's um, take another question. One question here. Um, I, uh, let's see. Let me look at it. I'm new asking about, uh, okay, my six, uh, six week old daughter, she stops breathing due to acid reflux. She is breastfed. Uh, I am eating a McDougal diet. What can I do to help her because the anti-acids aren't working and I don't want her to go through a uh, fundo Application. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, yeah, I yeah, I think I know. She's she's six weeks old. Six weeks old. Wow. Yeah. You know, that's 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 a, a difficult question for that's me to give a, a helpful okay. answer. Uh, there could be a lot of things going on. I, I would advise the mother to eat a very clean diet, as she says she is. I would also advise her to get a lactation consultant. Uh, maybe there's something that could be offered in terms of uh, how to hold the baby. 
uh, you know, how often to breastfeed uh, that may be helpful. Uh, doing surgery on a six week old for this uh, this condition, by the way, which I you know I know what it is, and I saw it much, you know, quite often when I was a, a young doctor in terms of my training. Uh, I, I would certainly look for other alternatives, uh, and that would be making sure that she has clean breast milk and uh, get a lactation consultant to help her in any way that they can. Be. Because feeding antacids to a baby seems like a pretty mm -hmm. tough thing. Right. And, right. and what I mean by a clean diet is you must eat a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. You add a little B12 to your diet, vitamin B12, and, and uh, that's the best you can do. But right. maybe maybe the lactation consultant would say, well, feed more often and uh, less amounts, or things like that might be offered for suggestions. But mm -hmm. having, that sounds pretty radical to have surgery on a six-week-old baby. Right, right. Um, I just want to mention before we go into the video, Dr. Madugal, that there are a lot of questions. I will download the chat later on and 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 get the questions that you that we couldn't cover today and. We'll include them in another webinar later on. So uh, I'm, I appreciate everybody being patient. You know we have hundreds of questions. It's not possible to get to all of them. Uh, Dr. McDougall, I found a video about with you and your father-in-law. <laughs> right. uh, tell us about this wonderful man. Uh, you know, I would love to. I love to tell you about. I could talk for hours about uh, Pat Like, which is what mm -hmm. his name. That's my my wife Mary's dad. Very religious man. They uh, were Christian reform in their beliefs, and uh, you know, I, as I say, ex extremely founded in the Christian religion, which uh, uh, dominated his life. He was a Finnish carpenter. That was his job. I met him when he was about uh, sixty years old. I, th I think that's about the time that Mary and I got together, <clears throat> and uh, we were as close as I was to my own father. Uh, they used to spend lots of time with us, uh, at least uh, three three months at one occasion and one month at another occasion every year. And uh, when we first started uh, uh, our relationship, uh, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law asked me to do physical exams on them, which I used to believe in. Uh, they should not be done regular physical exams. And I examined him when he was about uh, 65 and I small, found a small prostate cancer. Uh, it was about the size of a marble on his prostate. And I told uh, himself and Marge, his wife, uh, that he had prostate cancer and that I would like him to do nothing about it. And uh, then about 70 years old, he had his first heart attack. He lost the front of his heart. And they were still eating the Western diet, uh, the plain and simple. And I flew to Michigan, which is where they lived, and talked to the heart surgeon. I said, you will not do heart surgery on my father-in-law. Uh, he did, you know, for the reasons we talked about. And so he didn't have heart surgery. And that was a partial heart attack he had. And then he, he still didn't change his diet. Still was into, you know, a little pizza here and so on. And then he had a full-blown heart attack and lost the front of his heart. Then he had real religion about nutrition. Uh, <clears throat> He lived to be 93, but when he was 90, he developed problems urinating. And I took him into the urologist, a friend of mine, and he examined him and uh, asked me to come into the room to discuss his condition. And he says to me, he's 90 years old now. He says to me, your father-in-law has prostate cancer and that's what's blocking his urination. And I said, I know that. I said, I discovered it 30 years ago. And he says, you didn't treat him? You didn't have him treated? And I said, yes. He says, good decision. That's what the urologist told us. Anyway, he had some uh, some uh, medication to help reduce the uh, prostate cancer. He did well. Uh, he was fully functional, working in every day in his garden and in his uh, basement uh, as woodworker until he was 93. He had a stroke at 93 and uh, died one week later. Uh, so he had a very quick end to his life. I had to come and defend him in the hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan against the doctors who in his horrible condition wanted to keep doing CAT scans on him, all kinds of things. I actually told his private doctor, his name was Dr. Good, can you believe that, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I told him, I said, I'm gonna take you to your medical board if you keep doing this to my terminally ill father-in-law. And uh, believe me, I would have, but fortunately he left him alone. Uh, 
anyway, uh, he, had, he had a good life. Uh, we were very close friends, and he had a chance to uh, participate with me in uh, the uh, Lifestyle Magazine television shows we did, which uh, were played in 95% of the households worldwide for probably 35 years. They're probably still played. I'm not involved in them anymore. <clears throat> And you'll find one on gardening that he did with me, and and you'll find I think this one we're doing uh -huh. on the mud baths. Right. And by the way, Marge lived to be uh, 99 years old. But I have to tell you, just like I I, I think it is for other people, and I, we can go into this some way with a, someday with a webinar, is uh, you know, normal lifespan is about 85 years, and my great grandmother used to tell me it's not worth it after 90. Now there are a few exceptions. But for Marge and for my mother, I think those uh, those rules are, are generally true. Uh, you want to make best of every day you have of your life, but uh, you know there's a time when it's going to end. And uh, so they both had great lives. We had a chance to enjoy them. We took them on trips to Alaska, and Costa Rica, and the Panama Canal. Many of you listeners out there actually had a chance to know my mother and father and my father-in-law and mother-in-law because we were involved in our McDougal adventure trips. So with uh, Great joy because I love watching videos of us together. Why don't you go ahead and, and play this one? And by the way, you'll notice I was a couple of years younger. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> it's about two minutes long, so we'll just watch it right now then. Okay, At here one we go. Time or another, most of you have heard of people taking mud baths. And I bet some of you have even tried it. People have been doing it for centuries. And you know, I'm basically a curious person. So I decided to bring the cameras of Christian Lifestyle magazine to the Golden Haven Spa in Calistoga, California to investigate. And I brought my father-in-law here along for moral support. Let's go inside. When they say mud bath, they weren't kidding. I mean, this is something my kids would play in. I'm talking to Michelle Androvich, and she's the general manager of the spa here. Michelle, can you tell me what this is made of? Okay, it's a special formula of clay, peat moss, and volcanic ash. And tell me, what's it supposed to do for me? It really does relax you and take the toxins out of your body. Does it feel good? It's your turn to try. You want to give it a try? All right. Michelle, it feels like I'm floating. You are. The special formula allows your body to float because the mud is the same consistency as the, your internal organs. If you think about it, there aren't many times when you're able to have your body floating like this. So your muscles are really relaxing and your spine is able to just relax a little bit more. You know, some people have expressed concern about the cleanliness of mud baths. Yeah, we get that question a lot. Um, we have a system here with the mineral water. The mineral water comes out of the ground at about 140 to 160 degrees. Consequently, we, between each bath, each customer, will put the water on the tub and sterilize the mud. Sounds good. It is. After the mud bath comes the mineral bath. Michelle tells me this water comes from 400 feet under the ground. Europeans have been enjoying mineral baths for centuries, and now I know why. Am I any healthier? Well, I'll tell you, I sure feel like it. Well, how you can you tell how fortunate I was to not only have great parents myself, but to have uh, great in-laws. Uh, we we oh, spent so much yes. time together. Uh, I just uh, want to take a minute uh, to make sure everybody knows there's times uh, coming up that Mary and I uh, we'll have a chance to get to know you better. Uh, Dr. Lim and I and the rest of the staff will be taking care of many of you uh, this August at the 10-day program in Santa Rosa, California. It is the ultimate medical care and attention. Believe me, if you want to get off your drugs and it can be done, we will do it for you. If you want your health back, uh, we will help you get it. You'll get to meet Dr. Lyle, Jeff Novick, and all the rest of the staff. It is the ultimate in uh, behavioral change. Uh, with uh, direct supervision by uh, very qualified physicians, myself a board certified internist, I will be there, and Dr. Lim, a board certified family practitioner, he will be there lots and lots, both of us will be in Mary and so on. So this is in August, I think the next one we do is not until December because we have a whole bunch of corporate programs we're doing uh, in October and November. 
So this is the last chance till December to come to the 10 day program. And that's almost full. We have the advanced study weekend and that always sells out. So that's in September, September 16 through 18. We have direct flights from uh, many places into Santa Rosa. In fact, two new uh, flights, which haven't been very dependable, but one from, uh, I believe, Phoenix and one from uh, Las Vegas, now come directly to our clinic in Santa Rosa. And then we have uh, Horizon Air Alaska, which comes from uh, Portland, Seattle, San Diego, and Los Angeles, directly to our program. You're 10 minutes away. And then the rest of you will come in through SFO, San Francisco, and Oakland. Right. So that, that's the way you get to those, uh, either the 10 day or the advanced study weekend. Then uh, we'll have the December program, which is the next time we'll be able to have a chance to take care of you. And then, and Gustavo's going to be at the advanced study weekend. And then we have the, uh, the uh, Kauai adventure trip, which by the way, you may think I'm kidding, but it is uh, essentially sold out. But Mary, Mary bargains every day for another room when, when somebody wants to sign up. <laughs> uh, there will be a time when she will not be able to uh, pressure them into giving us more rooms. Uh, they've already made it hard for her already to get more rooms because we have filled uh, to capacity. But you'll never feel like there's a lot of people there, just the right number of people. Uh, to the Kauai Sheraton Adventure. Uh, the reason we're doing it again this year is because we had such a great time last year. It was the best food that we've ever had on a McDougal adventure trip. Wow. And uh, the adventures are phenomenal. There's an amazing beach right next to the hotel. So don't miss it. It's uh, going to be the end of January, the beginning of February. Again, you can find that on the website. And Gustavo will be there also. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's going to be my birthday, actually. <laughs> Well, we'll do a happy birthday cake for you. Yeah, but the food is phenomenal, and uh, you know I'll try and be at my best and give you a, a one-hour lecture every day, and the rest of the time is adventures, going to the uh, Grand Canyon of uh, Kauai and down a flume and uh, various garden trips and uh, all kinds of things. You can see what they are. It's 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 a deal, and I can only tell you that uh, our days of running McDougal Adventures are coming to a close. We did a great Alaska trip uh, last month. Uh, we're, I told you we're planning one through the Panama Canal in Costa Rica, but there are some factors in the world that may not allow us to do that trip. We may be going back to Alaska and a Zika virus is one of them. Oh. So, uh, you know, we just, we just don't know if and when we're going to do another trip after this one to Kauai in January, February, 2017. So, a lot of people call up all the time and say, well, when's your next Costa Rica trip? As far as I know, there will never be a Costa Rica adventure, even though we've done about 25 of them. And uh, soon I may have to say to you, there's not going to be any more McDougal adventure trips. The world won't allow it. Uh, so if you'd like to come and spend some really fun time with us, don't miss this, uh, yeah, this is a good chance. experience. It, it'll be the best one you've ever had. There are a lot of repeat uh, guests. And of course, there are a lot of new people. Right. And uh, I guess uh, I guess Dr. Lyle's going to be on next week, is he? Yes, we have Dr. Lyle next week, and so we will see you in two in about two weeks. Then about two weeks. Yes. And we'll we'll see what the world's doing by then. I'm sure I'll have we'll some see. comments. <laughs> it's uh, there's I, plenty of surprises to go uh, around. I very much appreciate all your questions, and of course, we want you to share this free, no gimmick, webinar with everybody that you can. And we have we must have. How would be, you see? You say we've been doing it for more than a year, or once a week. Yeah, so we've more yeah. than fifty free webinars there, and uh, and as always, uh, I don't give enough uh, appreciation for Gustavo's uh, participation in bringing out the best in me. And no. but people do; they write me all the time, and they say, "Oh, we so much enjoy Gustavo." And <laughs> well, thank you. Your, That's very kind. Your, your hard work and your communication skills. Uh, this would have never happened. Well. I appreciate it and it's my honor and my pleasure so uh, i look forward to every week like you said you know i i just really do look forward to every single week well thank you dr lyle is if he wasn't so good i'd say <laughs> there's no way i'd miss you next week but you want to tune in to dr lyle we'll have dr Lim on again and i don't know we'll, we'll mix it up and, and make we'll it mix it up. more enjoyable and these webinars are all listed on your website in the webinar page so everybody you can go and look at them. There is a webinar where you talk 
about taking supplements because someone here was asking about supplements. So there's a whole webinar on that. I don't know if you remember when, oh, when yeah. you did that. Yeah. yeah we have, right. We've covered a lot of things, but you know, I've been doing this for 40 some years. Let's see, 1968, right. I've started. Right. So there are a lot of things. I just kind of get the, got to get the, the cobwebs out and remember, mm -hmm. some, remember <laughs> some of the things that I've learned over the years and right. I'll share with you as much as I can. And yeah. as I mentioned many times, if there are people who disagree, be sure and write a special note to Gustavo at uh, what is it? no, it's webinar drmcdougall.com, and we'll make sure you get your chance on so we can kind of mix it up even more and have some fun. Right. Uh, right. I don't mind controversy. You know what I tell you is true. Makes sense. Solidly backed up by uh, the scientific research, and uh, what p p people say are you know based on uh, personal interests and industrial money. Uh, the truth is simple and easy to understand. You know, what you put in your colon causes colon cancer. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just so, so stupid, dumb, simple that to miss it, you can't be trying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you, for, Dr. McDougall. This has been uh, one of the best webinars you've done, and uh, people have enjoyed it. They're all saying that here, and your direct approach is. Uh, oh always uh, welcome and people love it thank you so I'm, much I'm, I'm out of control <laughs> <laughs> no no you're just the same wonderful dr mcdougall that we all love thank you thank again you, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks then okay bye-bye have a great week okay bye-bye goodbye everyone <laughs>